and welcome back to the hot lap where we're fresh from Japanese Grand Prix practice one and practice well 1.2 really because nothing much happened the rain spoiled it for everyone which means we're not even going to do who's hot and who's not because it's so hard to find out who's actually fastest especially particularly over those race ones but the biggest piece of news coming into or well, coming out of even the Japanese Grand Prix practice yeah Logan Sargent uh Oops. That's all I can say. I mean, oh, oh, Logan. I mean, for, for all the people saying, oh, it's so unfair. And I guess we were one of them. We intimated we were one of them. It's so unfair that Logan Sargent had to give up his chassis for Australia. Now he's been given the broken chassis that got fixed that Alex Albon had. And then he goes and does that. So James Vowles, fully, I'm sorry. Fully justified in my eyes now. I mean, I, I wish I was wrong, but no. Fully justified on the grass. Turn seven. Whoops a daisy. What I thought, <laughs> yeah. So, the, and it, what I thought was interesting is um, the quote from Grand Prix Diary saying, This brings to mind a brilliant bit of Williams driver advice once uttered by Patrick Head. One Pablo, you'll find it much grippier on the black stuff. Take heed, Logan Sargent take heed and now talking about it i mean the williams sashi uh, sashi uh, james Bowles, he's confirmed that williams are gonna not gonna have a spare chassis in the f1 paddock until the miami grand prix weekend the miami grand prix weekend embarrassing isn't it but apparently they're not the only team although we don't know who these other teams are so williams constraints at the beginning of f1 2012 for 2024 season were brought in the sharp focus at last month's australian grand prix when alex Albon did a whoopsie and they didn't have a spare chassis so the team lacking a spare chassis led to an unprecedented decision by Bowles who withdrew Sargent from the rest of the weekend giving his car to Alex Albon and Albon went out went on to miss the points coming home 11th I do think in hindsight it may have been worth the risk probably was looking at here we go again there, there you go look at that look whoopsie oops oops a daisy I mean it doesn't just quite cut it does it I mean he, he's got all the fans behind him and he goes and does he goes and does that luckily I don't think the chassis is actually broken so fingers crossed I mean let's get into then the practice one and two um the practice one and two times so practice one this is going to be the most significant running is uh yeah Verstappen fastest by a tenth from Perez. I mean, we predicted uh, Verstappen, Perez, and Leclerc. But that wasn't how the top three was. It was Verstappen, Perez, and Carlos Sainz. Just two tenths of a second off. What was interesting, though, um, uh, Russell and Hamilton, within half a second, you know, four tenths off, but within half a second. But both of them said it felt a lot better than Australia. The kicker is, Australia felt good until qualifying. So we don't know whether that's going to be the same Mercedes car going into qualifying, going into the race. The one thing both of them did say, though, it was a lot better than last year and the year before going into those S's. And what I think is quite significant about that, especially when Hamilton says it's a lot better than last year going into the going into the S's, is we've, it's, we're six months short. It's not like we've had a year. So if that is the case, they have this car, hopefully then, is an improvement over the last one however big question mark still remain what's going to happen in qualifying i think if mercedes can finish fourth and fifth like they did in practice one i think they'll be happy and i think we'll all be a bit happy leclerc half a second down so we're looking at he's yeah just shy of three tenths off his teammate alonso in seventh piastri eighth sednoda ninth norris tenth now both piastri and norris a second slower one second slower than Verstappen and this is a racetrack where McLaren let's be fair very much were the second fastest team like confidently the second fastest team well they had the second and third fastest car because Perez didn't really count he I don't know what happened at the last Japanese Grand Prix someone turned up it wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't peak Perez though was it so we have Albon in 12th Hulkenberg 13th Bottas in 14th 15th Lance Stroll Lance Stroll he's about a second I mean yeah, yeah no he's a second and a half off his teammate i can only assume that something to do with one plans maybe i don't know um 16th was i i can't i forgot how to, how to pronounce his name but was the uh that was the caravisa cash up rb japanese driver um and um, and what we're talking about a massive note here i feel i feel so bad for 
Daniel Ricciardo. If anyone needed time, he missed out on the Japanese Grand Prix last year. If anyone needed time to get happy with the car, it was Ricciardo. It was just a perfect storm of bad luck, really, for him. However, on the other neck, on the other side of the fence, you could say, well, you know, he's he's a driver. He's very very experienced. He shouldn't really need that much more time. He's not a rookie, and he's made the situation by himself. Yes, absolutely. I can still feel sorry for him, though. So 18th, you had Zhao. 19th, Banks. And last but not least, yeah, um, was <laughs> 20th, was this guy here. Logan Sargent. Oh, Logan, I'm so sorry. Okay, look at practice two, which yeah, well, I, I call it practice 1.2, because that's how, you know, it was like 20% important compared to what, what it really, really should have been. But it was Piastri. I mean, when we, even when we look at the, the different, the, the times, it was what, in the 130s of Verstappen, they were like about four seconds slower with a 134.7, yeah. Oh, Piastri. Hamilton in at second. Hey, I tell you what, Piastri, Hamilton, Leclerc, Sonoda. If that's your top two rows, if that's your top two rows, coming in and qualifying, absolutely. I will, I don't know, do something on air, um, on the qualifying show, because that would be absolutely ridiculous, but in a good way. Imagine that for the race. Um, Verstappen didn't even bother. He didn't even bother trying. So the only people that set times were um, Piastri, Hamilton, Leclerc, Sonoda, Ricardo did set a time, Norris, and Sainz. And then we had Zao, Bottas, Albon, Magnussen, Hulkenberg, and Ocon going out, but not really setting a time, kind of like just tipping their toe in the water. And it was water, because it was a bit wet, not soaking. Intermediates, just about. But where? And one of the reasons I think um, that Sky were talking to Bernie Collins, they had in their studio show, uh, she was basically saying that the reason why is they used to have four intermediates. If they use intermediates in the practice session, they'll get one back. But now they've got five rather than the four plus one. And then they don't want to waste it, you know, just in case because they're teams. I think you give them on practice, I think you give them ties separate to the race. Maybe that's the answer, at least for practice one and two. You, you know, you've got like a, an extra set each. You know, you've got one set of soft, mediums and hards just for practice. You give them back. You have to use them on Friday. And, you know, intermediates and wets, like a whole, a whole, the whole range just to test it out. And then you give them back at the end of the day. Sustainability? No, nah, yeah, maybe. But let's be honest. Um, Formula One is doing so much. Uh, and in terms of, I don't think... Um, when you when you pay so much money for practice, and some people, it is the cheaper day, can only afford going into practice. Let's be fair. Let's not forget that. Some people can only afford going to Formula 1 practice because it is the Friday. It is the cheaper day. Yes, these whole tyres, sustainability, but it's not very sustainable on those people's wallets that have paid really good money. Maybe the maximum they can afford if they're coming Friday and don't see any running whatsoever because F1 is being a tiny bit stingy on the tyres. But there we go, yeah. But, you know, for the fans, we race as one. <coughs> yeah, moving on. So, let's get into the Hamilton loses the Australian engine. Yeah, this is a bit depressing, really, if you're, if, you're, if you're a Hamilton fan. I mean, it's not like the end of the world, because at the moment, I don't think, no one thinks uh, Mercedes are going to go for the title. But, remember, he went out of the Australian Grand Prix. Just get rid of that ad there. It's stalking us. So, Australian F1 engine... Um, as Mercedes uncovers the source of failure. Yeah, he's lost the power unit that failed in Australia, the one that basically control, alt, delete, reset, and just turned off. Um, Motorsport.com has learned that with Mercedes having to go, you know, having to get to the bottom of what went wrong. So as we know, he retired in the early stages at Albert Park after his Mercedes engine stopped. So the power unit was flown back to Mercedes engine factory at Bricksworth for this post-race analysis to get an understanding of what happened. But there was no obvious explanation available immediately and the team are relatively unclear about whether or not it could be used again. But ahead of the Japanese Grand Prix, Mercedes discovered that the issue was a terminal one. And that means the engine can't be brought back. It's gone. It's gone. Um, it can't be brought back back into the allocation pool. Um, so Mercedes concluded the retirement was caused by a bottom end failure. No idea what that means. But that's been traced back to a quality process issue rather than a design problem. So all the Mercedes runners, um, yeah, get that get that bow, mop it with relief. The brow, bow, brow. Um, the loss of one of the four engines Hamilton has for the season at such an early stage makes it likely that he'll need to take an extra power unit and therefore a grid drop at some point later in the campaign. 
Oh, well. Most, most drivers are having that, aren't they? So it appears that the bottom end failure was a one-off. Analysis of the other engines within the current pool for Hamilton and George Russell showing no concerns of there being a repeat. Hamilton's retirement for the Australian Grand Prix has heaped further misery on a troubled start of the season for Mercedes, which is not delivered. They're looking a bit more positive here. So fingers crossed. Um, the guy under most pressure, I think, now is, once again, we said Danny Ricciardo. Uh, Perez probably a bit. And I think Leclerc. I think Leclerc's under a tiny bit more pressure as well, if I'm honest, simply because he wasn't doing too great, was he? Let's be fair. No. Um, at the Australian Grand Prix. And everyone's saying, oh, no, you signed the wrong guy. So he kind of needs to prove us wrong with practice one. He was a good few tenths off. But we will see. We will see. Anyway, that is pretty much it. If you've made it to the end, subscribe, please. That would be amazing. I mean, our subscribers have gone up so much. I looked for the Las Vegas Grand Prix, and what is it? It was like 260, which I thought was amazing at the time. Now we're over 750. It's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Subscribe, like, comment, doing anything is absolutely awesome, in my opinion. You know, just, just watching it, um, it, makes it, it makes it all worth it. So, so, onwards to qualifying. We'll speak to you soon. Thank you very much.